Well, hello everybody and welcome to this week's engineer interview. And um, we're joined today by Ross Beasley, who you'll be hearing from shortly. And um, to start with, though, my name's Scott and I work at Primary Engineer. Uh, I wanted to say a massive thank you for joining up to this year's competition. It's our 10th birthday this year, so thank you very much for celebrating it with us. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is the Leaders Award competition, and we asked the question, if you were an engineer, what would you do? Pupils from the ages of 3 to 19 anywhere in the UK can join, and every single person who takes part receives a graded certificate from a real-life engineer, just like the ones we interview. We then host public exhibitions and award ceremonies at the end of the school year to celebrate the amazing engineering ideas of the pupils who took part. Now, uh, we can't wait to see all of these amazing and creative ideas, and you're going to get some added inspiration today from our special guest speaker. Now, as part of these interviews, we're going to be speaking with engineers who work on loads of different projects, all of them showing the wonderful, interesting and exciting things that happen when you work in engineering. Now, although we host these interviews live, you can catch them on our YouTube channel. So uh, our special guest is going to start with a 10 minute presentation all about being a car crash detective. So I hope you have your detective hats on and then we're going to open up to questions from the audience. If you would like to ask a question, simply type it in the chat on Microsoft Teams. We unfortunately can't receive audio from the audience, so if you do have a question, please just type it in. But now I'm going to hand over to our wonderful special guest, Ross Beasley. OK. All right, thank you for the introduction. So hi, everybody. My name's uh, Ross Beasley, and today I'm going to talk to you about my job as a forensic collision investigator. But before we get onto that, I also wanted to tell you a little bit about me and how I got to where I am today. So this is me. And the reason I'm dressed like that is that is often how I have to dress for my job. Because when I'm out on site, I need to wear high visibility clothing in order to keep me safe. Anyway, I grew up in Cheshire. And when I was in school, I really enjoyed science. I wanted to go to university to study engineering. I'd all planned out, figured out what I was going to study, where I was going to go. Unfortunately, I didn't do so well in school and I didn't get the grades I needed to go to the university I wanted to go to. So I had to go to a different university. I still wanted to, still going to study engineering, but it wasn't quite what I had in mind. So I moved to Sheffield where I started my course. And while everything went generally OK, I was disappointed that I didn't get the grades that I thought I could and I didn't get to go to the university I wanted to go to. But I stuck at it and I worked really hard. And in my first year there, I managed to improve my grades and I managed to improve my grades enough to allow me to transfer to a different university. So at the end of my first year, I moved to Glasgow and uh, where I continued my degree in mechanical engineering there. Now there, I really enjoyed the course. It was really interesting, really enjoyable. And I was really pleased that I managed to, to get, get back on track and, and get back to where I wanted to go originally. I enjoyed the course so much that I decided to stay on and do a PhD. So I then became a doctor of engineering. And when that finished, I got a job in Edinburgh. Now this was a job that I thought that I wanted, um, but after a little while, I realized it wasn't for me, it wasn't quite what I expected, and it's not what I wanted to do long-term. So after about two years there, I decided to leave. And it was then that I found my way into the job that I do now. And this job I absolutely love. It's really interesting and really enjoyable. And at that point, I also moved back to Cheshire. So it kind of, um, kind of came full circle in my journey there, really. So the reason I wanted to tell you this is that, as you can see from my journey, it's adapted quite a lot along the way. Things didn't always go to plan, didn't quite uh, work out what I, as I expected. But I think that's OK. So me not doing so well in school and getting a job I initially didn't enjoy in Edinburgh, I don't see those as mistakes because I think they they helped me get to where I am today. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be where I am today. So something I'd like you to take away from this really is that if things don't go to plan or things don't quite work out how you hope, then that's OK. There's always a way to change it. If you work hard, you can always get back on track to, to where you want to go. So if you don't do so well in school or if you end up in a job that you don't enjoy, don't worry, don't get despondent. You can always change things and turn things around and get to do something that you really enjoy. And particularly within engineering, if engineering is something that interests and excites you, then there's always an opportunity in engineering for every, everybody, no matter their background. So anyway, that brings us on to my current job. So as I say, my, my job title is Forensic Collision Investigator. What I think that really means is a car crash detective. And so if there's been a car crash, it's my job to figure out what happened. 
Now, when a car crash happens, it's not often initially clear what happened. And I like to see it as a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle. All the pieces are there, but they're all jumbled up. You can't tell which way, which way round the pieces go and how they fit together. And so on first glance, it's very difficult to know how it how it goes together. Fortunately, I have a detective toolkit. And in that toolkit, I have a number of different tools which help me put all these pieces together. So the first one of these, there's six main tools that I use. First one, vehicle evidence. So that relates to the vehicle that was involved in the collision. Scene evidence, that relates to the location where the collision occurred. Onboard computer that's built into the vehicle, that can help us. Police and witness evidence. CCTV or dash cam video footage. And research simulation and crash tests. So these are the six main tools that, that I can use. So going through these, vehicle evidence. So as I say, this is stuff that relates to the vehicle that was involved in the collision. And a large part of my job is I get to go out and inspect vehicles. I travel all over the country to look at different vehicles. and I look at the damage that they sustained, any defects or faults that might the vehicle might have. I look at things like the airbags and see whether they've gone off. And I also uh, closely inspect the seatbelts. Now, just from looking at seatbelts, I can often tell if they've been worn in a collision. Now, I know all of you will know how important it is to wear seatbelts. They keep us safe while we're, when we're in our cars. And it's yeah, very important to wear them. But some people decide not to wear those. Not only is that illegal, it also can be very dangerous. So if there's a car been involved in a collision, I can often look at that and I can tell if somebody's been wearing their seatbelt or not. So next is scene evidence. So this relates to the location where the collision, the collision occurred. Um, I often I go to site and I look for things that might be still be there. So tire scuffs, rubber uh, marks on the road, any debris, pieces of plastic, things like that that might have um, be still be at the side of the road. And I spend a lot of time going out to site and surveying. And so what this means is I go out, take photographs, and I take lots of measurements um, of, of the roadside. So this picture here on the right, this is from a site survey I did a little while ago. And that piece of equipment you can see is a thing called a laser scanner. And what that does is it sends out a little laser around in a big circle, and that laser captures lots of measurements of everything that it can see. Now, when I get back to my office, I can download all that information and combine it into a 3D model. So it's a little bit like a computer game. I can create a 3D model of that particular location and that bit, bit of road. And that's a, a tool that I use for, for kind of um, seeing what could have happened in the collision. So next we have onboard computer. So vehicles have computers embedded inside them. And if I can access those, I can often find information out about the vehicle. Now, some vehicles even store information about the vehicle at the point of a collision and also in a few seconds up to the point of the collision. And this can include the speed of the vehicle, whether the driver was braking or steering, whether they had their seatbelts fastened. So if I can get access to this information, this really helps me understand what was happening with the car in the moments just before the collision. Next, we have police and witness evidence. So I work quite closely with the, with the police and I often get access to their reports and their evidence. Um, this can be very helpful in, in kind of understanding what they saw at the scene if they, if they attended. And another thing that the police will often do is speak to people who may have seen the, the collision and they will take their accounts in a form of a witness statement. I then can get access to this, these witness statements and that again helps me build up a picture as to what could have happened at, at the collision. Next, we have CCTV and dash cam video footage. Now, dash cams are becoming more and more common and a lot of people have them in their cars. So if a car is driving along with the dash cam and they happen to see a collision in front of them, if I can get access to that video footage that was captured of the collision, that can help me gain an understanding of the movements of the vehicle. With access to the video, I can work out the position of the vehicles. And from the time on the video, I can then use that to calculate the vehicle speed. So again, this is another way of, of helping me determine what the car was doing at the point of collision and in the moments prior to the collision. Finally, we have research simulation and crash tests. So this is something I, uh, I do quite a lot, is that uh, I can make computer simulations of a, of a collision. And then this com combines with the 3D model that I can make, that I mentioned earlier, 
of the of the scene of the, where the collision occurred. So what I can do, as you can see in this little animation here, is I can put models of cars in that model. I can then crash them into each other. So I can test out different scenarios as to what could have happened at the time. I can compare that to all the other things like the damage from the vehicle, and I can that can help me understand what, what happened. So as well as the virtual testing like this, and what we also do uh, physical testing where we actually get cars and we crash them together and we just see what, what happens and the damage sustained. And that can again help us understand what could have happened. Finally, there's lots of research out there into, into car collisions. And so we can use that as well to help gain an understanding as to how it could have happened and, and use that to um, how, other, how the research relates to the collision that I'm investigating. So they're the six main tools that I generally use. And if I apply each of these tools, what this allows me to do is it helps me figure out the jigsaw pieces, what way around they go, and helps me put the jigsaw back together again. So using all that, the puzzle is solved. And I've got a picture of exactly what happened in the collision. And I figured out what happened in that case. So that is a very brief introduction to my job as a car crash detective. And now I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, I have a question to start with, however, and that is Ross, what do you love about your job? I, I, there's lots of things I love about my job, but um, I think the thing I love most is that every case is different and every puzzle I need to solve is different. So no two days are the same. So that keeps it really interesting. And yeah, one day I can be doing one particular type of collision, another day can be another one. And I get to travel around the country to investigate these things as well. So yeah, no two days are the same. I spend a lot of tra time traveling around to lots of different places. And um, and yeah, the, and the puzzles I find really uh, interesting and satisfying to solve. So um, yeah, get, getting to do that every day, but a different thing every day is, is really rewarding, really enjoyable. So would you say that problem solving, obviously a very important part of your job, but is that an important part of being an engineer in general? Yes, definitely. Yes. I think if I had to sum up what an engineer does in one line, I would say it's problem solving. It's taking a situation that you don't necessarily understand initially and breaking it down into small chunks that you can work out how it works or how, how something happened or something like that. So yeah, it's it's problem solving, yeah, is, is basically the core of what an engineer does. Brilliant. Well, we've got some questions coming in now. Uh, we've got a question here from Bartlett's class at Heronview School, and they ask, what made you want to become a car crash detective? Hmm, good question. Um, I think, I've, I've always loved problem solving, always enjoyed doing puzzles and things like that as a kid. Um, and yeah, that, that was that was something that I, I knew I wanted to, to pursue um, that style of working where it is problem solving. Um, I came across forensic engineering as a as a career which which offers that. And yeah, each day is, is a different puzzle to solve. Um, and yeah, I just I came across this job and thought, yeah, this this really suits the kind of things that I enjoy and the skills that I have. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, I really enjoy it. It's been a fantastic job. It does sound very interesting and in putting puzzle pieces together to get the answer. And um, we do have a question in here as well about um, what you do with all those puzzle pieces. Um, and the question was, um, what do you do with the evidence? Well, I always uh, collate all the evidence and I prepare a report, which I then send off to um, the company that's, that's asked me to do this work. Quite often it's insurance companies, uh, but we also do some work for the police. So they will essentially ask me to go out and say, can you figure out what happened in this collision? So with all my evidence that I collect, I will prepare a report um, and explaining what I think happened based on, on my evidence. Uh, and then they'll send that off to them. Brilliant. Um, so th that's a little bit about what you do just now and how you work at your current job. But the Willows class asks, who or what inspired you to become an engineer in the first place? I think I'd probably have to say my dad because he was an engineer. And so just growing up, I was always aware of, of engineering and always asking him what he was doing in his job. Um, but also he he was very good. He is a very good DIYer. 
And so when we when he was doing jobs around the house, I would always ask him, like, oh, what's that? How does that work? And I always had an inquisitive mind. And he really encouraged that and and was always kind of explaining things to me in that way. So I think I just grew up naturally having a, a kind of engineering mindset. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, in school, I really enjoyed science. And um, yeah, I just I just like getting to 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 do experiments and things like that. So um, I think combining that with the, the problem solving and the, the upbringing that I had and always exposed to these things. Yeah, it kind of inspired me to pursue it as a career. Yeah, it sounds like it was quite important in you deciding what it is that you sort of not only really enjoyed, but what you wanted to do, because mm. as you say, you must go all over the country doing this. I do indeed. Yes, I've been up to Inverness and I've been down to the south coast and I've been to Guernsey and everywhere in between. Brilliant. So when you're going out to these sites, we've got a question here from Laura, um, and that's when you're often visiting them, what happens to be the most common reason that a car might crash? Um, quite often it's people, uh, some people deciding to drive dangerously uh, and not driving in the way that we should be driving. Uh, that's a, a common theme. Um, I think generally more often than not, it's yeah, it's somebody doing something they shouldn't be doing. So I think if if everybody is safe and drives uh, carefully, then then I might not have a job. So um, that sounds like pretty good advice. If everyone just stays safe and drives sensibly. Yeah. Um, so if they're the most common cases, what about the uncommon? We've got a question from the Darwin class that asks, what's the hardest case you've ever had to solve? Hmm. That is a tricky one. Um, another part of what I do, which I didn't really mention in this, is um, not just the collision stuff, but I also investigate mechanical failures. So I've done quite a few things on uh, lorries and heavy goods vehicles oh, wow. where they've um, they've noticed cracks in in the components, and so they've asked me to come in and say, "Can you can you work out why this is happening?" So this this is before anything's gone wrong with it, like if it's actually broken or been in a collision. But uh, as part of routine inspection, they might have noticed these things, and so yeah, they call me in to to look at these. So they can be quite difficult and quite challenging because if I'm faced with an entire lorry and I have to work out what's what's happened to it, it can be it can be difficult because I need to under, completely understand the component that's failed, the material that it's made of. I also need to understand what has happened to that vehicle before I got there. And so I need to ask the people there, like, what what's this thing been carrying? How heavy is the load? Um, so yes, that can be it can be very challenging to be able to work out the precise cause of that. Um, but I think, although it is challenging, that it's so rewarding uh, to get to do that. And when when I do find a solution, it's yeah, really rewarding and really interesting. Yeah, the, especially with something like a lorry, there must be a lot of moving parts to take into consideration. Um, there certainly and are, yeah. When you've got such a big challenge on, um, Becky's got a question, and that said, uh, do you have a period of time in which you have to solve these problems? Um, yes, generally. Um, so the people that the insurance companies that, that ask us to, to do the reports, they will often need to do it, need it done by a particular time. Um, but then at the same time, they often understand that um, some of these things are very complex. And so we can't do it like straight away and we need to go out, go away and do uh, and think about it and do some further investigation. So normally they're quite um, lenient. And so there's there's um yes there are deadlines but but it's it's always manageable but another part of what i do is if a uh, sometimes collision cases go to court and oh, so really? i will actually um stand up in court as an expert witness and explain what i believe happened um obviously when dealing with the courts there's much more strict deadlines and so i have to get it done by by a particular time um but yeah i think i was i always have a very methodical approach and and uh, and then it's I think it's always it's it's easy enough to to meet these deadlines. Um, I think yeah, as long as you yeah, do a structured approach and stuff. So brilliant, yeah. I had never thought about the fact that you may have to go and explain your workings, and <laughs> essentially you've got to show your homework to, yeah. to, to more people. That's it. Um, yeah. So we talked about some of the difficult cases you've had to work on. What about some of the weird ones? What's a weird case that you've had to try and solve? Hmm. Um. I did a case a while ago, which was 
not nothing to do with vehicle collisions. It was actually to do with somebody who got a, a, a fault that happened at a theme park. Oh, and so I had to go and and investigate that. So, although it was it was obviously very different to cars, it's the same kind of problem solving approach and the same uh, methodical forensic way of of solving that and figuring out what uh, how what caused the fault. So um, yeah, so that was that was very different. Um, but yeah, so yeah, really that was really um, interesting to get to work on something so different. Um, yes, that does sound quite different from a from a normal car. Yes, it's not like the same of um, going in a car with your mum and then all of a sudden it's <laughs> your own roller coasters. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got a question from uh, from James Seaton, and uh, it was about back to your um, how you became an engineer and what you're doing now, uh, and that's um, what uh, what did you study in university? I think you mentioned mechanical engineering. Did you have to do stuff with car crashes in university too? Uh, yes, so I studied mechanical engineering. Um, as my undergraduates, uh, I also then went to do a PhD, and my PhD was essentially in something called structural integrity, which is basically working out how strong things are and how they break and when they break and why they break. Um, so there was nothing particularly about car crashes that in my in my degree, um, but through my PhD, I did gain an understanding of of how and why things break. And so my PhD was focused on, it was a very different application, but it was focused on trying to work out when stuff will, uh, breaks in mechanical components. So that would kind of naturally led me into this, although it was a different application, it was the same approach. Yes, because I imagine that even in some of the pictures that you showed in your presentation, um, debris seems to be quite an important part of it. So you having an understanding of how and why and when things break and the way in which they break must come in quite useful. Uh, yes, very much so, yeah. <laughs> So um, we've got a question here from Buckton School, and they ask, what would you do if you were not an engineer? Hmm. Um, hmm, that is, that's a good question. Difficult one, because I've not, I've not really thought about that. But <laughs> I think um, I, I find uh, geography really interesting, actually, because yeah. um, when I'm not at work, I, I really enjoy going out into, into the nature and going into the mountains. Uh, and so I think through that, I've, I've always found geography and particularly physical geography and how mountains are formed. I've always found that really interesting. So I think if I was going to university again, I'd probably some, uh, study something like geography. Uh, that'd be quite interesting, I think. But it's still a bit investigating, <laughs> isn't it? Because you're still learning yeah. about the, the way the world around you works. Yeah, I guess so, um, yeah. So when you first started um, becoming a car crash, car crash detective, uh, was it difficult? And is it getting easier now? Um Yes, it's definitely been challenging, um, but then, I, well, I see the challenge as a good thing as well. Um, but yes, it, it's it was a steep learning curve um, because it was something that, as I say, I, I had a similar approach to things before, but I'd not done anything quite like this before. So yes, it was a steep learning curve, and also with the the legal aspects of things and and the court uh, yeah. going to court and things like that, that was something totally different. So it was. Yeah, it's, it's a different style of writing to to get used to that's suitable for the courts. Um, but yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to have my manager was uh, it was great and uh, yeah, really supportive and um, yeah, really kind of showed me the ropes. And yeah, it was a steep learning curve and I learned quickly. Uh, but it's it's definitely it gets easier, yes, because I'm exposed to more different and unusual things the more cases I do. So when I first saw, it, I thought, oh. I'm not sure what happened here. Whereas the next time I saw it, like, oh, I've seen something similar before. Uh, so I, yeah. I've got a good starting point as to what might have caused this. So yes, yeah, so it definitely gets easier the more different cases I do. But as I mentioned before, every single case is different. So when I get a new case, I have no idea what what happened and or I don't even know how I'm going to solve the problem initially. So that's the first step of the process is, is figuring out how I'm going to solve it. So when you are um, solving it and working, um, we've got a question here from Becky Turner, and Becky asks, what subjects from school do you find yourself so using in your job? Um, I think physics. I uh, definitely use, use a lot of physics in my job. And uh, yeah, some of the stuff I, I remember learning in school. Um, so yeah, it's still very, very relevant to what I do today. Uh, and more than just sort of the um, course you did in school, uh, Mrs. Romain asks, what other skills do you need to be an engineer? Um, good question. Uh, I think, yeah, as I said before, I think 
the problem solving. Um, so that's a, a kind of a core skill, I think, in, in being an engineer. Um, but I think more than anything, just having an inquisitive mindset and questioning things. And if you see something, you don't quite understand how it works. Think, mm, how does that work? I want to go and figure that out. And I think that's how I've I've always enjoyed learning and doing it, like learning hands on and and yeah and, and trying to work out how something works. And so that I think is a kind of a core thing for engineering as well, is just having that yeah, inquisitive mindset. So it's about it's about being curious, and part of being curious is going, why doesn't that work? Let's try and fix that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I spend a lot of uh, time doing just at things at home. If things break, then rather than throw it out straight away, I always think, mm, can I try and fix this? And yeah, more often than not, I can. So. Ah, brilliant. So it comes in handy <laughs> at home as well as at work. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. So um, we've got time for a few more questions. So if anyone out there is sitting on one, make sure you type them in the chat. We've got a question here from Hannah uh, and it's what's the best part of your job? I think the best thing, I think I uh, touched on it earlier, is that everything, every single case is different. So as I say, that's a challenge, but it's also really interesting. It means that no two days are the same and every single day is different to the previous day. And that, that for me keeps it really fresh, really interesting. Um, and then also, as I say, I, I travel a lot and I, I really enjoy that. I, um, I enjoy going out to different places and seeing different things. and. Um, yeah, I have to say the variety, I think, is is possibly the best thing about my job, really, that I enjoy. So with all that variety, when was the last time you were at a site that made you, you saw something that made you go, oh, <clears throat> this is something that went, oh, how did that happen? Or, oh, maybe I've got this. One, one of those moments where you just yeah. go, oh. That's a great question. Um, I think I probably have to say nearly every every visit. Oh, brilliant. Um, it feels like it's probably not a, a bit of a cop-out answer, but I think because every case is so different, I'm always learning new things. And uh, yeah, so when I when I go and see one vehicle, I'll I'll notice something and then I think, ah, that's that's a really good thing to look for. I'll look for that in uh, I'll look out for that in in other cases. And so yeah, I'm that's why I think in some ways the cases get easier because I'm always learning each time I go out and always building up my my detective toolkit that I mentioned. It's always get I'm always adding more and more tools to the toolkit. Brilliant. So you did <clears throat> you mentioned in your journey as well, you went to a university first, and then you went up to Glasgow and then and then you worked in Edinburgh as well before finding this Rob. So in, in terms of um how long it took you to study and work, how long is it taking you to build up to become a car crash detective? Um, well, so I, I first went to university in 2008 and I finished my degree in 2012. So that was four years. I then did my PhD was five years. Um, I then had two years in my first job and then I've now been in my current job for about two years as well. So yes, that sounds like quite a long, a long journey, but it has, as I said before, it, it's adapted along the way. So, um, it, I could have done it quicker, um, but for me, that was the whole journey has been has been really important to get me to where I am today. So even the job I didn't ultimately enjoy that I did in Edinburgh, it still equipped me with skills that I I use today. So yeah, I, I don't think you ever really finish learning. I think you're always always learning new stuff. So it, it's difficult to say yeah how long does it take to train for these yeah. things because it's always learning new things. Well, like you said, you learn something every single time you go to a new site. You learn something that might come in handy at the next one or the next time you see something similar. Um, and yeah. so we've I think we've got time for one more it. question. And the question is from um, the Sycamores class in Preston. What's your least favourite part about being a car crash investigator? <laughs> um, another good question, a difficult one. <clears throat> um, Again, I think I'd have to give a really bad answer and say I really struggle to to think about what I don't enjoy because I I genuinely love my job and I love going to work every day. Um, yeah, it's as I say, it's a terrible answer, but I I don't know I, I I feel I can't really answer that because I do really enjoy it. Oh, that's a good answer for us. I hope the second world <laughs> class like that one. There's <laughs> nothing wrong with it. It's just the, the job that you love the most. Yeah. Well, um, just noticing the time there, I think we're going to have to call this one to an end. So thank you to everybody out there who sent their questions in. But most importantly, thank you very much to Ross for sharing us with what it's like to be a car crash detective. Very welcome. Thank you all for your great questions.
Thank you, Ross. Now, um, it's everyone out there who's watching, it is your turn to come up with your own engineering ideas. Um, now, remember and send them to us once you've finished so we can get our certificates sent out and hopefully we'll see you in person at our public exhibitions at the end of the school year. Now, don't forget this interview will be uploaded to YouTube. So if you want to share it with other teachers or watch it again in class in full, you can find that when it goes live. Um, and also, did you know that we've got a podcast series? We're currently halfway through season two of the podcast with episodes being released weekly. So check out our website to learn more about that as we interview other engineers, much like Ross, who share the really exciting things that they're working on. But for now, I want to thank everybody out there. Massive thanks to Ross. And remember, if you were an engineer, what would you do?